This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a project funded by the Henry Luce Foundation and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation and hosted by Northeastern University. Sacred Rights is a project that supports public scholarship on religion and provides resources and networks for scholars of religion committed to translating the significance of their research to a broader audience. I recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website at sacred-rights.org or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Since 2017, I have talked to professors, authors, teachers, journalists, practitioners, and scholars about all things related to religion. On this episode, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Isaiah Young. Dr. Isaiah Young serves as Assistant Professor of Spirituality at the Claremont School of Theology in Southern California. He is an ordained Pentecostal Christian minister within the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. He is a recognized facilitator in the compassion practice and an internal family systems practitioner. Growing up in a multiracial and immigrant family, he is committed to sustaining transformational and collective efforts that address ongoing realities of social oppression with presence, passion, and peace. On this episode, we discuss the book Multiracial Cosmotheandrism a practical theology of multiracial experiences, which is out from Orbis Books. We also discuss the life of Ramon Panikar and several other projects. You can find his work online at spiritedrenewal.org, and you can find the book Multiracial Cosmotheandrism at the link in the show notes. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Isaiah Young. Dr. Isaiah Young, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks, Greg. It is an honor to be here with you today. I'm delighted that you're here. I'm wondering if you can spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners out there so they know a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then we'll inevitably dive into a little bit more of the stories in your life, too. Wonderful. So I am an educator uh, currently based in Southern California. I teach at the Claremont School of Theology in the fields of practical theology and spiritual formation um, and also interreligious studies. And I'm also an ordained minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, where uh, I've been a pastor, as well as a practicing uh, spiritual director as well. So let's get into a little bit of your backstory. I was looking at your bio, and your backstory, it it weaves in so much with uh, the writing and the books that you do as well. So I just want to know a little bit more about your life, because I'm looking at um, details about, you know, immigration multiracial family, um, like a history in the Pentecostal church. I'm just curious if you can tell me a little bit more about uh, your backstory, where you come from, that kind of forges your path forward as a scholar. Sure, absolutely. So definitely did not plan on being a professor or working in higher education. Uh, That kind of fell onto me in some ways, but I was really raised, we moved around quite a bit uh, growing up. And I lived in nine different states across the United States. And I come from an immigrant family. So uh, my parents uh, both were, then they met each other. They, my, my father's Chinese Malaysian and my mother's Mexican American. Hmm. And so their kind of relationship, their journey moving in different places to do to work also filtered just my own experience of who I was kind of navigating multiple worlds as well as meeting people in different places and really seeing a lot of the United States kind of in, in different uh, cultures of it. And so that that was really a big influential time for me. And then going into ministry, I spent a number of years as a pastor, as I mentioned, and did that for about five years. And one of the things I noticed still were all the difficulties that a lot of youth of color were having in my mm. congregation um, with the church, but as, as well as our spiritual growth. And so that led me into my doctoral studies, really beginning to think about how race impacts our spiritual lives. And so uh, that was really my question kind of going in. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but I know it affected me. I saw it affecting other youth in my my city. And so I wanted to kind of study it further. Awesome. What was your uh, history in the church like growing up? Were you involved in the same denomination growing up that you wound up uh, pastoring in later on? So I was, yeah, I was raised in the a Pentecostal denomination called the Assemblies of God. It's where I was raised. That's where I pastored uh, initially. 
but I actually transferred out of that denomination into the current denomination I'm in, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, during my doctoral studies. So the, the school I went to is the school I now teach, Claremont School of Theology, and they had a rich legacy with the disciples' tradition. I met a number of pastors and leaders from that tradition who really took race seriously, actually. It was, again, mm. that question of how do I really see and, and, and be helpful to those who are experiencing racism and racial oppression? And so this was a group of people that I saw really took that seriously and really wanted to make a difference around that. And so I ended up in a long series of events uh, moving into the Christian Church Disciples of Christ where I now am ordained. And I also still identify as a Pentecostal minister there, but it's in a, it's in a new home. I'm curious about your PhD studies as well. Tell me a little bit about finding your academic, uh, you know, heart. Where did you, how did your your path come into what it is that you wound up focusing on for your PhD studies? Yeah, so I think really, again, going back to this feeling when I was pastoring and also working with young people who were experiencing racism, uh, was recognizing that, you know, ideas or doctrines or teachings just alone wasn't enough to really support and sustain people. And so I really had this question of what kind of personal experience and transformation do people need and do communities need so that they can really sustain in justice work? And that really led me into this study of contemplative traditions widely, um, which is really the the practice and experience of the divine. Uh, many different traditions talk about that differently. Uh, many, many traditions have different practices that relates to that, but all of them are really about how does a person or a community experience the divine, and then how does that experience empower them to live differently in their life? And so that really was the focus of my studies. It was the contemplative traditions mixed with uh, critical race studies, which is really about how to really have a, an understanding analysis of how race works in North American society, particularly the United States. And then my question was, how could contemplative practices, how could spiritual experiences resource a different way to engage racial justice? Something that stands out to me in your work is the emphasis on the practical, right? Whenever I look at some of your your bio and your publications, I see the words practical theology standing out a lot. Tell me what that looks like for you either in your scholarship or your pastoring or both, what is practical theology um, in your view? Right. There's a longstanding joke that we call it, we call it practical theology because theology without the practical in front of it is impractical mm. <laughs> and doesn't really help and make a difference. And <laughs> while I don't totally uh, think that's always true, I think it goes to say the real emphasis on practical theology is about how do we think about the divine, um, the mystery, in ways that actually change our lives and our current lives uh, every day. A lot of times, especially in Christianity, the tradition I'm a part of, there's a big emphasis on the future, on some salvation or heaven after someone's life. But really what practical theology tries to do is to say, how do we not wait for another life to see changes or to see the things that we desire, but how can we actually live those out now? And so practical theology as a discipline is really about starting with lived experiences wherever they are. I mean, it could be a lived experience of, you know, a gaming community. It could be a, a lived experience of youth and young people. It could be the lived experience of artists. It could be the lived experience of podcasters, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever lived experiences there are, it starts there to really understand what people are going through, how they're thinking about it, how they're finding connection and joy and purpose. And then it's about bringing those lived experiences into dialogue with the religious tradition to ask, hey, what in the religious tradition might some of these, these lived experiences connect with? And then also, how would these lived experiences transform the way we think of our religious tradition? Because maybe the divine, maybe religious meaning is being found in new ways. And so when we start with lived experience, we're able to then actually transform theology or religious tradition, ultimately with the purpose of living differently through that process. So after we go through that, you know, with, uh, let's say, the the youth, then we understand after going through a practical theological process, now youth are more empowered to live differently in their lives. They feel more connected. They feel more creative. They feel more encouraged to go about the lives that they feel called to. Mm, I love that, too, because it sounds very vibrant. And, you know, whenever you're talking about your work of what you're noticing with uh, multiracial youth in the United States, and, you know, that area of focus, something vibrant and energetic and focused on the here and now really seems like it would be a lot more ab able to connect with the generation of people that are very young and have a lot of life, hopefully ahead of them. Right. So it's not focusing on someday. It's not focusing on the afterlife. It's focusing on a vibrant and energized and youthful approach to life. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, and I appreciate you naming that too, because especially in activism work and social change work, it can feel very difficult. And it is very difficult. It's it's heavy work. Um, it's challenging work. But I think that's the heart of what we're trying to do, especially in my work and practical theology, is to provide a vibrancy to it, is to provide a community to it. Because a lot of it just comes from, we got to find one another. We got to work at this together, not take it all on ourselves, not take it all in the ways that we can do it, but how do we find each other? And so that's really a lot of my approach. I think that's where a lot of the vibrancy comes from, is those relationships that really support and strengthen you. You've got a bunch of writing that you've done over your career as well, your young career. Tell me like... Tell me what your books are, because I know we're going to talk about one specifically, but I know you've got a bunch of books either out or in the works right now. Yeah, so the 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 book that we're going to discuss, Multiracial Cosmotheandrism, is really focused on mixed race experiences in the United States. Uh, that was my first book, and it was really looking at spiritual practices and spiritual experiences of mixed people so that they could be more connected to themselves but engage in racial justice. The second book I, I co-edited with Eric Kyle is called The Pulse of Life exploring the power of compassion to transform the world. And I was trained uh, in a contemplative practice called the compassion practice, which is really a visualization technique of being able to experience one's moments of connection in their life. Very ordinary moments. I mean, it could be the, the setting of the sun. It could be doing something you love, art or a hobby. It could be being with someone you care for deeply, whether it's a child or a friend. And it's really about visualizing those moments and experiencing their richness. So that brings kind of a fuel to the way you show up to the rest of your life. That's kind of a very small taste of it, but that that's a, that's a big part of the practice. And so we wrote a book exploring how this practice can transform education, social work, neuroscience, chaplaincy, and, mm. and congregations. And so that was the second book. I'm writing two more right now. One is on trauma and it's on an experience that I endured in 2018, a near-death uh, experience. I was severely uh, injured uh, on, in an auto accident, and I was healing for about seven months. I had to learn to walk again, and I learned a lot through that process, and so I'm writing a book about that journey. But I, the real big thing about this book is I'm writing it with my father, mm. who is also a scholar, a theologian, and we're really why we're writing it together is because we went we went through the experience together in some ways. They were the primary care, caregivers for me as I was healing, but also because we believe that trauma is dealt with best in relationship together. It's not just individuals overcoming, but it's about how do we have relationships together. And so that book is really co-written so that we could talk about our journey of healing as individuals, but also how we he healed through coming together. And so we hope that book can can help others. Um, that's called. Uh, Spirited Renewal, Contemplations on Trauma and Transformation, which hopefully will come out in 2025. And then the last book is one I'm writing with my partner. We've been together 12 years. We have four children, and we're writing a book on contemplative parenting. Mm. So we want to talk about the different practices in our lives that have helped us to learn more about ourselves, become more self-aware of our own past and experiences, and then also ways we can show up to care for our children, to repair when needed, when there's a rupture in our relationship, and also being able to creatively and imaginatively engage them in kind of creating our household. And so and that book is coming out in 2025 as well. Um, and we're, we're, we're in the midst of writing that. We're, we're really grateful for it. Let's talk about multiracial cosmo theandrism, a practical theology of multiracial experiences, which came out from Orbis Books. Tell me a little bit about the goal of this book, because I was reading some of it, and it's really interesting so far. I'm not super far into it, but I am enjoying it. Tell me what you're trying to accomplish for the readers with this particular book. Yeah, so the main purpose of this book is really to say that our spiritualities are vital and essential to any racial justice work we want to engage in. I come, the book really looks to a long lineage of spiritual teachers who did social justice and social activism work that really understood that the activism was only possible if it was coming from a deep place of spiritual aliveness. And so that book really wanted to name that, but it also wanted to then apply that to a very particular population, which is the multiracial population in the United States. So when we talk about the multiracial people, we're talking about children whose parents are caregivers 
have different racial identities than each other and also than the child. Mm. So it, you, they're raised in a household where there is no common racialized experience. It's different in every way. And so it also creates a difficulty for the multiracial person to really know how to engage their racial identity. So when we did this study, what we saw time and time again was when we went through, I created a program that was helping people through contemplative practice engage with their racialized experience, tend to it compassionately so that they can be empowered to move in the world in a way that would do justice um, for their lives as well as others. And what they said was for all of them, this was about seven college students in different universities in Southern California, they had never had a sustained conversation or space to really think about the ways that race impacted their experience as multiracial people. Mm. So that was a huge eye opener for them. It brought up, of course, a lot of pain, a lot of maybe unresolved questions about where do I fit in and where do I belong? But ultimately it was through the contemplative practice and through community that they were able to then work through some of that, find some new ways to engage it, and then also be empowered. A lot of multiracial people tend to be very avoidant or to deny their racialized experience if they don't have support. And that's because racism is so prevalent, particularly from critical mixed race studies. It talks about the, the presence of mono racism, which is assuming that every person, their racial identity is only one thing. Mm. And so it doesn't allow to see the full racialized cultural experiences that people have. And so for mixed people, mono racism is a big barrier that prevents them from really being able to share about their experience with race, how they think about themselves, where they can fit in. Because a lot of times if they try to say, well, I'm more than one thing, it automatically is discounted mm. or it's assumed to be something that is only benefiting white supremacy or furthering racism because you're not fully identifying with with some group or another. And so for, for our book, we really want to be able to look at these experiences. It's actually grown two and a half times in the last 10 years, according to census counts. Mm. And multiracial population is expected to triple in the next 20 years, the fastest growing racial group in the United States. And so it's a really important group of people to look at and understand if we're committed to racial justice and healing. Amazing. Whenever I was reading your bio as well, hearing about your own parents and things like that, I was just like, this is such an important story to tell. And I'm, so I'm really glad that you're doing this kind of work, especially within the traditions that you work within, like within your 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 um, pastoring work, within your professoring work. And, you know, something that really stands out to me the last several years is um, the way the media has dissected the terms critical race theory. You know what I mean? It's been such a prevalent piece of conversation. And I love the way that you brought in some new terms that I had never seen. Multi-crit and critical mixed race studies, uh, like the lenses, right? I wonder if you can just tell me a little bit about the lens of the book a little bit more detail, because I really think it's cool to uh, like define and identify these key terms uh, for listeners out there. Yeah, that's great. And it is. Uh, critical race theory, CRT, has been a widely contested, debated uh, theory that a lot of more of the conservative politicians have used to kind of demonize any kind of diversity, equity work in colleges. I don't believe all those accounts are all warranted, but that notwithstanding, focused on what multicrit is, is it is a branch of critical race theory that's, again, applied and specifically focused on multiracial or mixed race people. So when we talk about multiracial populations, one of the most important things to remember is that this is not a monolithic group. In other words, mixed race people are all different from one another. There's all different kind of mixed experiences, and there is no one perspective that can sufficiently capture multiracial populations. We group them together more so to talk about this phenomena of having the shared experience of having parents or caregivers with different racial identities from each other and differ from the child. But each individual is going to have such differences of how they navigate that. They might be mixed with different culture identities, ethnic identities, racial identities. And so when we talk about multi-crit, it's really important that we are ensuring to look at the rich diversity of this group as we engage different approaches to racial justice. And so Jessica Harris from UCLA was one of the first people to write on this. And she really goes through the different themes that are present in critical race theory. And then she transforms them to be specifically legible to mixed race experiences. And so that is what multi-crit is. And so a couple of examples that would be different 
Um, critical race theory talks about racial uh, differentialization, which is that how uh, people of color can be experienced uh, in different settings. Well, Jessica Harris takes us further and says, if you're a biracial or multiracial person, not only can you be experienced differently in different settings, but whole parts of you might not even be included at all in different mm. settings. And so while, you know, you may be here in the United States, this they get, one example they give is if you're a student at a university and you're working in the marketing department as a student worker, a, a staff member might come to this person who might be mixed, maybe white and black and say, we're so glad you're part of our office. You're so different than the rest of people of color, really looking at their white experience and their white identity, trying to, to lift that up. And mm. then an hour later, that same staff member might come to them and say, hey, we're really wanting to do a promo of all of our diversity in our office. Would you be on the front cover of our marketing campaign? Mm. Really emphasizing the fact that the person's not white. And so you see how just in a matter of an hour, the same person, the same interaction can be com completely viewed differently in their experience based on their dual identity. And so that that creates a lot of confusion about who one is, about how to engage effectively, and how to embrace the wholeness of themselves. And so multi-crit is really a way of breaking down critical race theory to be specifically applicable to mixed race people. There's other critical studies and theories out there. There's tribal crit, there's queer crit, there's black crit, Latin crit, there's parent crit. And mm -hmm. there's discrete disability studies. So a lot of different populations have taken uh, the critical race theory and tried to work with it to be more applicable to the population they're thinking of. So multi-crit is doing that for mixed race people. Mm, and critical cri great. And critical mixed race studies is really, it includes multi-crit, but it also in includes other theories that may be helpful in understanding mixed experiences beyond just multi-crit. So critical mixed race studies is a group of interdisciplinary scholars that's looking through education, psychology, sociology, anthropology, at how the mixed race experience is shaping uh, the the discourse uh, about race politics. Mm. And I've never talked about that on this podcast before. So you are the very first multi-crit and critical mixed race studies person who has ever been on this podcast that we've specifically like, like hammered down on those uh, on those terms. So that's really awesome. And we're going to talk about something else I've never talked about in this podcast before, which is a Roman Catholic priest from Spain named uh, Ramon Panikar. Um, did I say his name correctly? Because yeah, I don't you know. Did wonderful. Yeah, is. you could you could go to Spain and, and say that and you'd be accepted. <laughs> Amazing. OK, so this is a person that I've never heard about on this podcast, but who shines through in your work so mm -hmm. importantly. Who is Ramon Panikar and why is this person so important to what it is that you do? Yeah, well, thank you for bringing him up. So the book actually was published due to it being submitted to the Ramon Panikar Prize in 2022. So Ramon Panikar was a philosopher, theologian, a mystic, and a monk. So he was somebody who lived and spent the majority of his life on multiple different continents teaching about religion, practicing spirituality, writing philosophy and theology. So he was born to a mixed family. Mm. His father was Hindu from India. His mother was Spaniard and Catholic. And so he spent his whole life kind of navigating the multiplicity of his own family of origin. And in growing up, he became first a Catholic priest and then actually was sent to India by the church to, to do work there. And while he was in India, he rediscovered all the, the lineage and the culture from his father's tradition they really didn't have access to growing up in Europe. And it was also during the same time that his theology was evolving. And so as he was learning about Hindu culture, also the religion, he found himself to be totally empowered and engaged by the teachings and the tradition. That kind of set his life on a trajectory, what he's known as the one of the fathers of interreligious dialogue, because through his experience to India, through his family of origin, he not only then embraced his Christian identity, but he embraced a Hindu identity. After that, he studied Buddhism in India as well, and actually really embraced a Buddhist identity. And then all the while he was teaching in Harvard and UC Santa Barbara, 
and understanding kind of the secular culture of the United States, he also embraced a kind of scientific secular identity religiously to where he understood himself to have a religious orientation that was at least fourfold, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, and, and secular. And mm. so for him, he he actually had to rewrite a lot of Christian theology so that it could be compatible with these other teachings and, and his own take on it. And so he wasn't trying to say that all religions lead to the same place. He actually was deeply respecting the differences, but he also saw that the differences enriched each other. Mm. And so I, I think agree. that comes, yeah, that comes from his mixed race experience. I think like being a person who understood that being Hindu and Indian, being Spaniard and Catholic enriched his own life. My argument is that that's what led him on this journey of really studying and being open to others because he saw that two things could exist at the same time mm. and the, and it could be positive and beneficial. And that also led him to the kind of theology. So my book really says that he's a person we can learn from anybody who's mixed race and is wondering, where do I fit in? How do I embrace all these aspects of myself? Well, here's a person who understood how important that was spiritually and who can then be a guide to us so that we can learn to do that creatively in our own lives. Yeah. I love in the book how you call him a bridge and prophet for multiracial experiences. That was a really cool, nicely concise and phrased uh, way of describing him. And you know what's so interesting to me, too, is like I've been doing this a long time, right? I've been a religious studies high school teacher for a long time. I have made 300 of these podcast episodes on this show. And the fact that I have never come across this person's work, it just goes to show how uh, broad and rich and deep spiritual traditions and religions around the world actually are and how there is no limit to what you can discover if you just keep going in your own learning. Because I'm amazed all the impact that he had that you just described so clearly. The fact that I've never come across Ramon Panikar is really kind of incredible to me. So I'm just having a blast right now learning something brand new. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And you know, for him, you know, being a monk, he wasn't the most publicized individual. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it. But I also think part of it too, which I argue in the book, from a critical race perspective, he wasn't really understood. I don't think fully into what he was trying to do. Yeah, he was trying to rewrite theology and philosophy. But if you're just trying to understand his theological ideas, I think you're missing a lot. I think what he was really trying to embody and demonstrate through his life was the fact that there can be a harmony. There could be a connection through really radical diversity. Yeah, He wasn't trying to, to water the diversity down. He wasn't trying to hide the diversity. He was trying to say, no, the diversity actually is what makes us all enriched. And so the more we can lean into the difference, the more we can really, he talked a lot about the power of listening. And uh, he wrote a book on peace called Cultural Disarmament. And in this book, he says, what's most important if we're going to engage in transformative work is that we learn to disarm ourselves, all of our ideas, all of our beliefs, all of the things that we hold so dear, and really just listen to another person and try to, as best as we can, join them in their experience. So that's a spiritual practice, not just a spiritual mm -hmm. practice of listening, but really using our embodied lives to get on the inside of another person's life if they're willing to share that with us so that we can really have a better understanding and ultimately so that we can change our own lives based on their perspectives and based on the things that they see. And so in that sense, it's not really for me about all the things he taught, but it's about that life he lived spiritually that I think is not just important for mixed people either. That's a lesson then that we could all learn in a time of polarization and fear and war and violence. How can we create spiritual communities and practices that allow us to really understand one another? I think is really important. Amazing. You know, writing books is very, uh, it can be fun. It can be stressful. It can be horrific. It can be cathartic. It can be sad. What are some standout memories for you of the process of putting this particular book together? Yeah, so I like to think of my writing again as a spiritual practice. I mean, it's what I studied, it's what it's about, and you know, for me, if I'm not doing my life as a spiritual practice, then something's missing. I try to approach everything like that, especially book writing, because that gives me a chance to really think deeply about where I'm at, the conversation in the world, how I want things to be different. So, of course, in writing this, there was some painful parts because I was really having to experience and remember my own feelings of exclusion, my own feelings of of questioning my identity, of where I fit in, of what insights could I offer to the world. I mean, when you spend your whole life as a mixed person, kind of constantly not being fully recognized for who you are and what you bring, 
you know, it's a, it's a painful thing. But what I tried to imagine the book for, and also the, the students that I, that I worked with, who I'm so grateful for, is that instead of just focus on all the ways that we are discounted, what if we can see all the creative connections too, that we're actually in some ways forced to make because we're mixed. We can't fully land in any one place. So we constantly have to find something we can connect with, work with, you know, engage. And so in the book, it was difficult and painful. And it was also generative because in writing it, it allowed me to kind of see, oh, you know what? Thanks to Panikar's work, thanks to these students, thanks to some of the people who are doing multi-crit and other spiritual practices. No, we actually have a lot more to say and a lot more ways we can engage things that are creative, which we need. We can't get caught in monolithic thinking, kind of just repeating the same patterns. How do we bring new ways forth of being together, especially in this time? And I feel like in some ways, mixed race people are kind of at the forefront of that. And so I think in writing this, it really was a mirror for me to really embrace that in a way that I hadn't never done before. Well, I'm really enjoying my journey through multiracial cosmotheandrism, a practical theology of multiracial experiences. It's really cool. I'm loving getting some background information on you and your life and where you came from and at this book, you know, the directions that you came at it really adds a lot of uh, rich and warm contextual detail to help me in my my own journey through the book. So Another thing that I'm thinking about is the ways that you are getting involved in public scholarship, getting out there, getting your ideas uh, for a wider audience, right? You're a part of a, a program currently at Sacred Rights, which is a, a project that is working with scholars who are involved in like the world of religious studies in some way to be more public facing and out there in the public conversation. And each cohort that I've worked with over the past couple of years has been a little different. And this one seems to focus a lot on untenured early career scholars, which is really cool. I'm just wondering if you can tell me a little bit about your experience with the uh, public scholarship training cohort that you've been working with lately. Yeah. So it is a wonderful privilege to participate in that cohort. It really came at a beautiful time for me to really think about the kind of voice and insight I want to bring to society. Of course, a lot of times as scholars, professors were trained to really only speak to the academy, to speak to other academics. And so this training is really empowering and encouraging because it's reminding us, no, hey, you have valuable insights to share if you are able to think about what you want to communicate into a different audience. And so rather than just thinking about the audience of academics, you know, what about what's going on in the world? And so they give us a lot of practical insights, connections with wonderful people like yourself mm. to be able to then think about how we can share what, what it is we're doing in a different way. And so what I found through experiencing the program is, you know, especially in a, in a life of research, you're always thinking there's so much I don't know. And I still feel that way. <laughs> like there's mm -hmm. so many things that I feel unqualified to speak on or, you know, I want to learn about. But what they really kind of wanted to emphasize with us is that, no, you've really spent a lot of time thinking about particular issues in particular ways. And so that can really benefit a lot of people in an age of misinformation, in an age of a lot of content being pushed out, you know, AI and other kinds of things. Well, what is it uniquely that you've looked at? And then how how do you want to position yourself to be able to speak to that as things go on in society? And so for me, it was really just empowering and encouraging to not only be trained in that, but then also to see the example of others who are navigating those questions, like you mentioned early on in their career. A lot of times our institutions depending on where we're from, they may or may not look as favorably on public scholarship based on how they're evaluating professors. That's one of the challenges. But in the training, we talked a lot about different strategies and different ways we can find a rhythm so that we can still accomplish you know, the life that we have as professors, as well as really extending what we're doing. And so I'll just end with this by saying part of what that training really encouraged for me is to start a brand new organization called Spirited Renewal which I co-founded with my partner and my father, people awesome. I'm writing our next projects with. And that really is a public scholarship vehicle to be able to deliver monthly reflections, to be able to offer guidance and teachings, to facilitate retreats and workshops. It's a way for us to engage the wider public about the materials and the, the interests we have for people who aren't going to go to higher education, aren't interested in studying it in that way, but is still make it relevant. And so we're excited about that. 
Awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Isaiah Young, where would you encourage people to to check out uh, if you want to plug anything or promote anything to listeners out there for uh, following along with what you do? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. So go to our website, www.spiritedrenewal.org, as well as our Instagram account at Spirited Renewal where you'll find stories, insights. We also feature a lot of other voices that are nourishing and giving life to us within our work. And so you'll get introduced to a lot of material and content through that. But ultimately, we'd love to just meet and engage folks who are committed to spirituality and social change in the world. And so we'd love to engage with you at Spirited Renewal. Excellent. Well, I will uh, put those links directly in the show notes for this episode for listeners out there. Dr. Isaiah Young, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on and spending time with me on Classical Ideas to talk about your work and your life. I love this conversation. Thanks for being here. Thank you.